Well, thanks for having me today. Uh, hopefully, I'll be able to explain how we have managed to um, kind of beat the odds, because uh, probably many of you understand that um, the chance or the percentage of companies who make it to the third generation is 10%. The, the number who make it to the fourth generation is about 2 to 3%. And so uh, the odds aren't all that great. Uh, in reality for small family private businesses to perpetuate for 82 years and so the question is is you know how do we how do we get there um, why have we beaten the odds so far and first is you have to from our perspective you have to choose a strategy and how you want to comp compete we kind of uh, I heard a Harvard professor by chance by the name of Michael Tracy kind of sum that up very simply. Um, he believed that basically companies compete in three way, one of three ways. They need to excel in one of them and be very capable in the others. The first is what he called operational efficiency. Companies, a company who's operationally efficient is a company who's going to invest in their um, procurement practices, their processes, to really be more efficient. Uh, if you're thinking about a company who does this, it, they're not necessarily innovative. The quality may be just okay. Um, their service may be just okay. Um, to me, the epitome is efficient. Well, due to our size and culture, um, and also given all the people in our industry who choose to compete on price, um, we don't think that's necessarily the right long-term strategy for us. We need to be competitive. We need to work very hard on what our pricing is, but to go head to head with the Walmarts and the Marks of the world probably would not work for us. The, the second area that he said companies can choose to excel at is something he called product leadership. And what he meant by that is companies who choose through the breadth of their product selection, think, think Toys R Us, through the uniqueness um, of their product selection. For some, maybe that's Godiva chocolate for chocolate. Um, or through um, the quality of their products. You know, maybe that's something like the body shop or something. But the point is, is they provide something in terms of how they, um, in terms of their product selection that gets people to go there versus maybe more convenient places. Well, what does that mean for Heinen's? Um, you know, grocery stores, at least the way we look at it, by definition, need to be many things to many people. We also believe that nobody, no company, can be the best at everything they do. So for Heinen's, what we need to do is to have product leadership positions in some areas and be capable at the rest. And so we do believe we've done that. We think we have a uh, product leadership position in, for instance, meat and produce, um, where we source our products in ways that are very different than most grocery retailers. We also uh, believe our wine and beer. We, again, due to sourcing, that we're a destination for many people. Um, what Steve referenced, our food service departments. I mean, we believe that when you, or when a customer is trying to solve that proverbial question of what's for dinner tonight, um, what we offer in terms of prepared and semi-prepared options for that that are nutritious, fresh, um, convenient and relatively inexpensive, um, there's nobody who really does it any better. So the last area that a company can choose to, to compete in is something that Tracy, um, that Harvard professor, called customer intimate service. And, and what he really meant by that was that, uh, that you really understand or even anticipate your customer's need, and then you would meet and possibly even exceed their expectations in fulfilling that need. What does that mean for Heinen's? Well, what we believe is that no matter the size of the company um, or what happens in the marketplace, um, there, if you can truly provide a world-class customer service experience, there will always be a niche for your business. There will always be someone who can sell for less. There will always be somebody who has a product selection that in some aspect may be better than yours, but providing truly world-class customer service is something that is very difficult. A lot of companies pay at lip service, 
but they don't really deliver to it because it takes a lot of time and a lot of organizational effort to accomplish that. So in short, when Heinen says, how are we going to compete in what is a very competitive marketplace that we operate in, as I'm sure it is for all of you, um, we need to excel at customer service, be a product leader in some areas, much better than the average in others, and be competitive on price. Sounds pretty simple, right? Um, well, for us, um, it's not that simple. Um, but if we're going to be successful, customer service is what Heinen's has chosen that we're going to truly excel at. So that's what I'm going to just touch on a little bit more. The first thing that we believe that perhaps makes us a little different than some is that we believe our employees, and we actually call them associates because we work with them versus they work for us, um, that our associate satisfaction is the number one driver of our success. If you were to ask the average retail uh, store what's the most important aspect of their success, most would say, well, it's customer satisfaction. That is obviously very important, but I don't think you can drive, or we don't believe as a company, that you can drive really high levels of customer satisfaction without highly satisfied associates. And I think that's worth repeating, because it's really the core of everything we do, which is that you can't possibly deliver that world-class customer service unless the people who are working with you are highly satisfied. And actually, there's another professor, this time a Texas A&M professor, who uh, coined a term that, that we truly believe in. And he called it the service profit chain. And what that really is, or what that says very simply, is that the level of associate satisfaction drives their loyalty. More, more loyal uh, associates are going to deliver a higher level of service. A higher level of service drives higher um, levels of customer satisfaction. More satisfied customers or, or more loyal customers, higher spending customers. That's higher sales, which means higher profits. Higher profits allow you to invest in your people, and you start the chain all over again. Again, it's, it's, it's a very simple concept, um, but so if you if you say, okay, associate satisfaction is the most important aspect of our success, what do you do to increase your associate satisfaction? It's a complex um, answer, and there's kind of many threads to it, but, but probably in one way it really distills down to a phrase that I'm sure you're familiar with, which is enable your people and then empower them. You have to enable your people by providing the knowledge, skills, and tools that allow them to be successful. Again, sounds pretty easy. Why don't more companies do it? Well, for one, it costs money. Um, secondly, you know, generally people with more experience are more expensive. And again, it's that perspective that so many industries I mean, so many companies, especially in our industry, they look at their people as really a cost to be minimized versus an asset to be leveraged. And so they say, ooh, that's, a, that's a, um, a lot of money to be spending on these people. And the third thing is you can probably add companies don't do it because of ego. Um, my experience has been that there's a lot of managers who think that they're responsible for their company's success. And that may be true in a two-person company. In a company with 2,500 people, I don't think it's very accurate. So um, you have to understand it's your people who drive your success. And I might add, and again, in our industry, um, we have lots of high school students. Um, and a lot of companies, when they talk about training and enabling their people, they're kind of drawing this line somewhere. You know, and in, in our case, it's everybody, including high school students. Um, companies tend in our industry tend to wait, oh, I have to wait till the person's here for a while, and, and they would never think about training students, even though for us, they're about 18% of our workforce, and for many people in our industry, it's even a higher percentage. So you got to train everybody, regardless of what their particular role in the organization is. One other just kind of 
thing that we've learned in terms of this training process that might be of some value to you is that um, the lesson we learned is that as we train people as the first step, um, we intersperse personal development skills as well as professional skills. Um, the lesson that we've learned is that um, unfortunately most people don't feel they're capable of changing and if you're going to get someone confident in their ability to change, they're much more likely to attempt to do that in their personal life than they are in their professional life. And once they've experienced it in their personal life, that you actually can change something, then you have a foundation on which to build a change in their professional life. So we use two models to help our people understand what it means to deliver world-class customer service. One is very simply what we call the service pyramid. You know, what we help our people understand is that, that the traditional customer service that is all about being polite and responsive um, is that you need to go beyond that if we're truly going to be successful. Nice, respectful, responsive is great, but we really need our associates to be knowledgeable about the products they sell. And we, they need to be striving really to become invaluable to their, to their customers. Again, it's a pretty simple uh, model. The second model is what we call our operating model, which is really just our tool for helping our people understand what we call being a retail professional is, being a sales merchant, and being a business professional. And those tools go hand in hand with having the need to set and clarify expectations for how work gets done. And for us, that's simply called the diamond standards. Um, and it, it, again, in essence, said very simply for us, is it helps people understand that as an organization, we have to accept nothing less than excellence as we do our jobs, and that good enough is not good enough which is, I think, probably in retail um, in the retail environment, um, too often we all settle for that. So all this kind of focus on our associate satisfaction um, can be summed up a little bit is that we don't think as an organization, especially in our case, you can be successful through inspection and supervision our world is way too complex for that, as I'm sure all of yours are. But in our case, 2,500 associates, we have 200,000 customer transactions a week, we carry 40,000 items, and we sell 2.5 million items every week. How in the world do you inspect and supervise that kind of complexity? We don't think you can, so if you don't enable your people with the skills, the knowledge, and the tools to be successful, we don't think it's possible. So again, maybe this sounds easy, maybe it doesn't, but I would suggest that you think about your own customer experiences in retail, whether it's food or otherwise, to say how often are people really meeting those types of uh, goals. So in closing, you need enabled leaders, you know, people who are committed to your organizational vision and equally committed to building teams of people. They'll lead enabled associates, getting the right people with the right skills and the right job. That will lead to more highly satisfied um, associates and they feel valued for what they do. They feel coming to work each day is important and that the job they do is important in helping Heinen's to be successful. And those satisfied associates will then lead to a different shopping experience for our customers. If I had to characterize that experience, you know, customers would feel an energy that's kind of fueled by our associates being engaged with them and our customers being engaged, that our associates are communicating their passion for food and sharing it with customers. And then lastly, customers who leave the store in a better mood than when they arrived. You know, too many people look at grocery shopping as a chore. 
And when it's a chore, we have a lot of people we compete against who may be more convenient than us. And that last point about leaving the store in a better mood than when you arrived, you know, that's indeed our litmus test as a retailer. If, if our customers are leaving the store in a better mood than when they came, then chances are we're gonna do okay. And again, ask yourself how often that happens in your shopping experiences. Instead of think about how many times you actually plan your shopping trip by trying to avoid problems in the store. And so um, we rec we're, that's what we're trying to accomplish, that our people, our customers are walking out of the store in a better mood. We recognize we've got a long way to go to have that happen, even the vast majority of the time. But we're trying to get there. Um, and as an organization, I think that uh, all 2,500 people, or the vast majority, are truly care about delivering that kind of shopping experience. So in short, that's how we plan to be around the next 40 years, um, is, is focusing on our people and, and delivering the kind of customer service that you just cannot get anywhere else and, and really makes you want to drive by all those other convenient places that you might go to. So with that, um, you know, it's been my experience that I can talk about anything, but it may not be what you're interested in learning or hearing about, so I'd love to open it up to questions and, and I'll answer any questions anybody might have. Good, you're all asleep. I got it. You mentioned that a lot of your employees tend to be young people. Do you have a large turnover rate at your stores because of that? Well, uh, not as much as we used to. Um, is that uh, obviously the economy has, and I'm sure you've seen it in your businesses, has changed the dynamic of the employment world. But uh, we have some, but uh, you know, obviously we have students who um, go on to college maybe and, and we get them back at holidays or whatever and, or come back the following summer. Um, so there is some turnover. What, what, uh, what frustrates many people applying to us, quite frankly, is that uh, in today's world, it won't, wasn't always this way, won't be this way in the future, is we hire very few people for two or three months' work in the summer. Um, that used to be all we did, you know, because people would come, work a summer, and then go on to other things, um, whether that's you know, high school, college, whatever. Uh, pretty much every student we hire now um, has to work through the school year. Um, and, uh, and again, in the summer, we have so many college kids coming back to us that uh, we hire some, but not many. Uh, and uh, we're, you know, we're, we are an employer of choice. You know, one of the things that makes us unique as a, as a retail grocery company is that, uh, as I said, we think our two things that I said it manifests us in the fact well, let me backtrack. Two things that I said manifest, um, and the two things are that uh, we really believe people are really important to our success. Oh, I've already lost the second one. Um, it's getting old, it's hard. But what I was gonna say is we're only open 85 hours a week. And, and so that means we close at 8.30, which is really unheard of for a retail grocery store. We close at six on Sundays. And it's all about because um, we believe, you know, what, what my brother and I say is if we don't want to work those hours, nobody else should. So we're closed on holidays um, because I don't want to work on a holiday. And, and so uh, we, we have, and what we tell our people, quite frankly, is that, you know, you have to differentiate our experience enough so that we can afford to close at 830. We can afford to be closed on holidays. If people aren't willing to somewhat inconvenience themselves, although 85 hours is a long a lot of hours in the week. If, but if people aren't willing to inconvenience themselves um, to get to us when we're open, then guess what? We'll have to be more convenient, and that means being open later. It means uh, being open on holidays. So that's a kind of a long-winded answer to your question. How do you advertise? What's your method of advertising? Well, you know, it's, as again, I'm sure many of you are going through the same things that, that, uh, that we go through. Um, we do not do radio and TV. Uh, we used to do a little bit of each, but there, 
uh, number one, from our perspective, very, very expensive. Uh, uh, secondly, is that the, they don't reach people like they used to in our perspective. Uh, our industry has done a weekly flyer for as long as, as, as I can remember. Uh, we're, doing an, an, uh, we're doing everything in our power to get out of that. Um, because, again, that's not how people get their information today. And so, I, you know, I would say that, and it'd be interesting if anybody had a perspective, is so electronic media. You know, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, um, we're communicating with our customers um, via email, and, and that's the future. It's, it's cheaper, you can tailor the message um, enti you know, entirely differently, and, and that's where it's going. And, and broad-based uh, media approaches, in our belief, are overpriced and under-effective. So uh, we're trying to, you know, I've got a lot of gray here, we're trying to uh, get better at that whole new world. And, you know, as any business, you have to find that fine line. The reality is, is most of our customers are not 25-year-olds. You know, they're 50-year-olds. And, and not to imply that there aren't 50-year-olds who, who are very electronic capable, you know, but, but the reality is, is we still have a lot of customers who want their information delivered in very traditional ways. But every day that goes by, that changes for all age groups. So electronic media is the way to go. A couple of things. I'll do the, well, I guess they're both pretty easy, actually. I, I'll take the second one first. Uh, I'm a believer that any associate um, who wants more responsibility has that opportunity within our company. It's that simple. We have that much of a need. And wh where things start to fall apart is that our belief of what it takes to get there and their belief aren't necessarily mapping perfectly. And, but as an organization, we spent, again, a lot of time helping our people understand uh, what, it, what we need to do, helping our, uh, our providing skills to people um, so they can be successful. So in terms of career path, what we tell people is that number one is the door's wide open in terms of getting jobs with more responsibility. Uh, but with Heinen's being a relatively small company, you have to also be patient. It takes time. But, but the reality is, is the first rung up the ladder of like running a department, you, pr you bring the right work ethic and the willingness to learn. And, and, and the biggest thing that, I mean, like I'm sure many businesses did, and certainly the grocery industry was famous for this, we made the same mistake is, you know, and the one lesson for young people is, is we're pro we used to promote purely on technical skills. Hey, the guy's a great worker, you know? And then you put him in management, and, and they couldn't manage people. And, and you heard me say is we need leaders who build great teams. So we're looking for not just the work ethic that can do tasks at a high level. We're, we have to have people in management who can motivate people and work with people. So anyway, so the career path, is slow but steady if you have the, the skills and the, and the willingness to do it. The benefits, we believe in benefits. Um, we try and provide benefits. I mean, I, the grocery industry is a little bit like the auto and steel industry. We're trying to um, compete with people who don't provide benefits. We're trying to compete without a legacy cost. You know, when benefits were cheap, all of our, we're a union operation. And, 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 uh, and so, you know, we, which is fine. It provides, you know, some hindrances, but it, we don't really struggle with it. And the, but we have a legacy cost of providing retiree health care. And the challenge is, is that the average customer who shops us, they don't ask or care, do they shop Pinus because we provide benefits? I don't think so. And, and so uh, I wish more people did, but so we're, we're kind of operating with providing benefits with you know, the, the cost of have all this retiree health care. Um, 
with the cost of, we believe in providing benefits to our people. We're trying to find a balance with that, but I, I think that we do a pretty good job of that. And we're trying to find the balance, not just with our people, but with our union. Um, I mean, you'll love this example, uh, is that you know, we're a merit-based company. You know? Do the right things and we'll take care of you. And we have a long history of, of doing that. And so uh, you know, unions are all about bringing everybody to the middle, and which is mediocrity in, in, in anything. And so we said, well, we want to provide benefits. We had to restructure our benefit package so you don't get benefits at Heinen's as a person right away. As you start with us as a new person, you don't get, a benef you don't get medical benefits right away. And we said, well, we, there are people we want to give benefits to. They've demonstrated the ability to do that. And you said, oh, can't do that. Can't provide benefits to some and not to another. And we said, yeah, why not? Yeah. And, and then we, and we, it, it was resolved when we said, well, you, the union, you tell, you tell this person that Heinen's wants to pay for your benefits and the union's stopping you, stopping Heinen's. So, Long-winded answer. Well, it's it, the economy. We all know it, it's pretty rough. You know, you have a population that's at best stable, an economy that's at best stagnant. Um, it's overstored. Um, so uh, we're struggling through that, just like every business almost. Um, we, are, we have said as Heinen's uh, that growth opportunities in Cleveland, greater Cle all our stores, 17 stores are in the greater Cleveland area. Um, growth opportunities in Cleveland are limited. And so we are starting to look outside of Cleveland uh, to expand. We want to use our, the, um, the, we want to leverage our self-distribution, um, our warehousing system to to do that, but we are looking outside of Cleveland. So we'll, we'll, we'll see. So what, do you have a succession plan in place for you and your brother? Who's next and what's the plan? Uh, you know, we, um, we operate with a very simple set of what we call core values and strategic guidelines. Um, one of the things in the strategic guidelines is to make enough profit to invest in our business um, and to invest in our people and to manage to fourth generation leadership. Uh, the fourth generation for our family means there's three, between my brother and I, we have three children. They're all in college. We have no idea where they have any interest. We have no idea if they're even capable. Um, and, and I'll speak for my son, I doubt it. Um, but uh, um, probably on both scores. He's not interested in, I mean, but, uh, but no, I mean, I, I think so. Uh, but, but what we will do is if, if, if they are not interested or prove not capable, uh, we're going to keep running it as a private business. I think um, one of the things we recognize is those 2,500 people allow me to stand up here and, and, and have this success story. And so they get screwed if we sell. So, uh, or a lot, a lot of them do it at least. So um, our, our, what we are very upfront about is we share our financials so our people understand, are we making money, not making money, sales growing, whatever. They get all that. And again, the very simple message is when you start seeing all that stuff go like this, then you have to start worrying about us selling. And, and we'll certainly talk about it, but as long as we're successful, we have no reason to want to sell because we recognize that all of you, I meaning our 2,500 associates, are probably going to be worse off and, and that isn't fair because they're the ones who've built whatever success we've had. And if they're not building the success, then I guess they're not losing much. Earlier, um, something you said, I drifted off and started thinking about how it affected my company. So if I miss this, please forgive me. But with fuel costs rising, obviously the competitors have to deal with the same costs that you do. However, I would like to hear what you think about what the future holds for yeah, and it's and in our in our industry, it isn't just fuel. I'm sure you've also seen um, the news about commodities. All the grains are up. 
it's, the prices are rolling in. I, I mean, uh, we saw a few right around the first of the year, but they are rolling in, and, and, and quite frankly, they're not rolling in at two or three percent. They're rolling in at seven or nine percent. And I'm sure many of you would say, oh, I'd love to raise our price at seven or nine percent. Um, we can't raise our prices seven to nine percent. And, and you know, we're in a very competitive industry. I, you know, think about all the options that you have. I mean, you have the other traditional supermarket now, which is Giant Eagle and Dave's and so forth. You have Mark's, which is kind of a hybrid. Um, now it's just a lousy supermarket from my perspective. It used to be a discount store. Now it's just a lousy supermarket. But, but you have the warehouse clubs. You've got the niche players. Um, and although he's a great entrepreneur, so I should, I should qualify that. Um, but with lots of competition, I mean, every one of you, I mean, there's people in this room who, who and would say, I'm a very loyal Heinen's shopper, and you probably are, but I may only get 30% of your business. You know, yes, I get 30% consistently, but I get 30%. You know, and, and, and so is that loyal or not? Depends how you define loyal. Um, and so the, the, point, the, the, the point is, is um, that we know, we, in the grocery industry traditionally has made 1% to 2% profit. And so there's, there's, there's not a whole lot of room there to not pass on price increases. So every grocery retailer is balancing right now trying to um, raise prices um, but not drive their business away. And, and it's going to be tough, but the price increases are there. Um, I think they're starting to stick. I mean, what we saw a little bit ago, maybe a year ago, was that the economy was so bad they'd raise these prices and then they would backtrack. But they've either decided they can't afford to backtrack or, or something, their business is a little better, that they're starting to stick. So, you know, I, you got to love our government. I mean, I, I, is that uh, they say, well, you know, fuel and food don't matter. <laughs> well, I don't know about you, but that's a big part of all of our budgets. I mean, so uh, food does matter. And, and we do see that. And we see people change behavior. And, and we're very cognizant of it. So, yeah. There you go. And I tell her, you know, the money you're spending in gas, you're, you're spending twice in gas what you're getting right. in, in, in your savings. Yeah, well, there's that, and especially with $4 a gallon, that's yeah. true. And I'll give you another perspective on, yeah. I'll give you another perspective on that, is that, you know, one of the, the vestiges of our industry is that there's this mania about price checking. And so, I mean, literally, we used to have what everybody in the market was across 10,000 items. I mean, I mean, this is the way it worked. Now, labor is a little more expensive, and we only do we don't do 10,000; we do 2,000 items. But, but, but we do we know the prices in the marketplace, and and so what I can tell you is this: is and I should we know that number two is we know um, the term we've used is Cleveland's a fiscally conservative town. You know, you can say prudent, you can say cheap, you can call, you know, and, and you can call what you want, but people care about their dollars here, and, and we recognize that. So you take, we know pricing, we know people care about being, you know, that they want value, and there's nothing wrong with that, quite frankly. So uh, here's the, the last thought to put in your wife's mind, is that the reality is, is that we do lots of price comparisons. We'll even, you know, take her receipt, and compare it to what our prices would have been at Heinen's that day. And I can honestly say we've never, ever been embarrassed doing that. Our prices are competitive. We're a little lower on some, a little higher on others. Um, and and the, the, the worst case scenario, unless you're just by just an inveterate, I buy the cheapest thing possible, even though the quality stinks type, type thing. And for some people, you know, food is subsistence. It isn't something to be enjoyed, and, and that's fine. But, but um, that isn't our customer. Um, and, but point is, is five, ten dollars a week. I, I, if, uh, that's the premium for that anybody would shop Heinen's. Ten dollars a week. Five hundred dollars a year. You know, I look at it and say, people are willing to pay four dollars for a cup of coffee at Starbucks. 
and they're, dri and, and, and they're driving around. They're driving around to save 20 cents on a thing of toilet paper? Come on. You know, get serious. And, and, and so, but $500. And so what I, what I challenge people is for that $500, think about the time you wait in line because fast checkout is something we're pretty good at. Um, the time you wait in line, the time you get annoyed because some you know, clerk is A, not available, B, rude, C, unknowledgeable, whatever. Not, not, we're capable of doing that, but, but less frequently. Um, and, and is that worth $500? And I'd say, I don't think so. And so, you know, I really believe, I mean, one of my favorite pet phrases is, food's an affordable luxury. You know, in this time of kind of cutting back, you know, don't cut back on food because you can, we can afford to eat really well. And for 500 bucks a year, I tell your wife, you know, think about how, more, how much more productive you could do doing something she might actually enjoy. She can't enjoy that. So, yes. Yeah, I mean, private label, um, you know, I, I, I mean, I could go through the litany of bad decisions I've made. Private label would be a good one. I can, I can rationalize this a, a little bit, but, but the reality is, is that the whole world was going toward private label goods. And, and what, we, what I said is that, hey, you know, number one, our size of a company um, really makes it hard for us to do that well. Uh, and then number two is these national brand consumer companies, the General Mills, Procter & Gamble's of the world and so forth, aren't so stupid as to allow you know, this non-value added price thing get in the way. They'll eventually lower their prices. And what I didn't understand is A, some of them are that stupid, and, and B is some of them have their foot in both camps. They're producing some private label here and producing their national brand so they feel they got the market covered. So I didn't get, it took me a while to catch on to that. And, and uh, so, but you know, I, slow learner, but I learned. And so we started looking actually about four or five years ago um, for a solution. And what we found was what we believed was a sea of mediocrity in products. And, and what we also found was that uh, there was very few um, natural and organic in terms of offerings in terms of private label. And we looked and we looked and as a company, quite frankly, we didn't have the skill sets. And so I, at the risk of really boring you is we, um, do you guys remember when Wild Oats was in town? Well, Wild Oats was a struggling natural foods purveyor and they were looking how to grow. They need to be, they felt they needed to be bigger in private label. And we were going to do the unconventional thing for a supermarket. We were going to, sell, even when they were in Cleveland, we were going to sell their private label in our stores because they had the natural, organic, and quality and selection of products we thought made sense. And, um, and so we spent a year and a half trying to make that work. And, and I'm sure the CEO of Wild Oats at the time would say, I was a blockhead. I, I, I would say he was a blockhead. And, and the point is, is we never got it done. Well, four months after we resolved that this was never going to be agreed to, uh, Whole Foods bought Wild Oats. And, but I'd spent so much time with their, <laughs> with their buyer for, for private label, I convinced them to be an entrepreneur and go into business and we'd be his first client. So we've used him and he had all the contacts and, and he could, you know, and, they, and, and it's all about being lucky. I mean, Things change. The, the technology changed. You know, companies would say, well, you need to you know, run a million units at a time. But you know, for printing reasons or for produce, production reasons, and machinery got more sophisticated. They could do smaller runs. And at the same time, the economy was tanking. So companies that would never have been willing to sell us a few hundred thousand units of something suddenly said, you know, our business is down 20%. Maybe we'll take these guys' phone calls. So bottom line is, more than you want to know, um, it's been very successful. We think, we, we, as I said, we do surveys electronically. I found someone earlier that we've done it for grocery. And one of the questions we asked about was private label. And, and the customer satisfaction on our private label products has been very, very high. 
And so it's been a big win for us because it's allowed us to be more competitive price-wise. It it's allowed us to differentiate because we, we offer some things you just can't get elsewhere. So we, we love it. Do you have an opinion? Right. There's a lot of them, right? And I just was how yeah, I mean, we think, I mean, think about, I mean, and all of you can attest to this or not attest to this, but the customer has changed. I, the, my favorite example these days uh, is to talk about how the customer evolves is, you know, you guys probably aren't old enough to know this, but, but the rest of us have gray hair. And so you remember, with bottled water, when did it get to be really big? You know, what was it, 10 years ago maybe? And what was the, 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 the status symbol was carrying around a bottle of Evian, right? That was it, or Perrier, sorry, it was Perrier and then it was Evian. And so, you know, it had to be Perrier water. And, and, and suddenly, you know, you're having guests over and you're serving private label water from a variety of places. And you don't, not only are you not embarrassed to put a private label product on your table and serve it, but you actually may be bragging about it. Aren't I a savvy consumer? Was that a fair understanding of how things have evolved? And, and, and part of it was, you know, again, things changed. 15 years ago, still true today, but 15 years ago, most private labels stunk. It was, you know, sea level quality. And, and, but today, it's most private, a lot of private label is really high quality. And so, I, I mean, it's really frustrating to me, I mean, in the sense of that, you know, you see the, you know, the general mills of the world and you say, how can, they just gave us a 9% price increase. And, and so we're coming out with a private label cereal, you'll see that. Uh, because it's just like, it, the value is not there. To them, it's a, yeah, and there's no question, um, younger people. But, I, but I, again, our, genera our customer base is not the 25-year-old. It's, it's more the 50-year-old. And think about this, and I, you know, I hopefully don't offend anybody with this comment, but I, I, you know, I have friends, female friends, who, you know, again, 15 years ago, you know, they, if they were wearing something from Marshalls or whatever, you know, they would never acknowledge that, right? They were bragging about, you know, and I don't know the brands. Unfortunately, my wife's not a big shopper, but, 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 you know, fancy shoes or purse. You know, today, what they talk about is, yeah, I've got this fancy belt on from whoever that costs, you know, gobs of money, but I also I got these shoes at Marshalls that are gorgeous and they only cost me 15 bucks, right? Isn't that the way it works today? So, I mean, the customer of all ages is evolving and even faster at a younger age. And, and that's the challenge for every business is how do you balance those, that spectrum of ages? I could go on forever, so I'm really sorry. <laughs>